Hello and welcome to Kettle and Bones, where we make really delicious, really healthy food. And you can too. Today we continue our Keto Italian Dinner mini-series. Last week we made an amazing antipasti salad to open the meal. Today we're tackling Il Primo, the first. Il Primo is often a pasta course, but pasta? Low carb and keto? <laughs> How's that gonna work? Unbelievable. That's how. Welcome to Keto Italian Dinner Part 2. We're making meaty lasagna. Let's get cooking. Lasagna is basically a meaty, saucy, cheesy, layered casserole. We'll be making the ingredients for all our delicious layers one by one, starting with the one that takes the longest, the meat sauce. In a roomy pot over medium-high heat, we're going to start by searing about one pound or 450 grams each of ground beef and sweet Italian sausage. I'm using sausages that I have already removed from their casings. I'm taking a handful of meat and shaping it into, I guess you'd call this a patty. I want to sear it as one single piece for at least a short while because that is going to give us both a wonderful sear on the meat and some fantastic fond on the bottom of the pot. And both of those things equal flavor. I'm removing the seared meat to a separate bowl and repeating until all the meat is nicely seared. Don't try to get the patties cooked all the way through. All we need at this point is a good sear on the outside. Just as we'd planned, we have a bowl of flavorful meat and a pot that's full of meat drippings and fond. And this is the foundation of our sauce. We're going to go down to medium heat now, and like many sauces, this starts by sauteing some finely chopped onion. This is one whole white onion. We're also going to take this opportunity, before the pot gets too crowded, to roast some of our spices and seasonings. In go some red pepper flakes, some oregano, and some freshly ground black pepper. We'll let this go for just about one or two minutes until the onions start to soften. And then, in goes some tomato paste. This is six ounces, or 170 grams. Let's toast all of this together for another minute. And then, in goes some fresh garlic. I'm using four medium-sized cloves, but you can make this as garlicky as you'd like. Next, well, hello there. If you count in the onion, we have our old friend, mirepoix. mirepoix. That's the French term for about two parts onion and one part each of carrot and celery. Fun fact, in Italian, it's called sofrito, sofrito, but it's the same exact concept. You may also have noticed that in addition to the typical sofrito, sofrito. I also have some chopped green bell pepper in here. Bell pepper plays really nicely with these other veggies, so I'm doing it, but if you don't have it or you don't like bell pepper, it's not essential. We still have all that wonderful flavor stuck to the bottom of the pot, so let's deglaze with a splash of white wine, maybe about half a cup or 115 milliliters, and some chicken stock, probably somewhere in the neighborhood of two cups, about 470 milliliters. Next, I'm adding two cans, about 56 ounces or 1600 grams in total, of Italian vegetable royalty, San Marzano tomatoes. These can be whole or chopped. We'll have plenty of opportunities to break up any large chunks later. And yes, I'm aware that tomatoes are technically fruits. Let's add some water to this as well. I have about two thirds of a tomato can's worth of water here. The exact amount of water isn't crucial to our success. Most of this water is going to cook off. We're just adding this to make sure that the sauce doesn't dry out during its long simmer. Our meat bowl comes back out now, and I'm going to roughly chop this to break up the bigger pieces. And in it goes. Don't worry if you still see some larger than desired meat chunks in there. These will soften and fall apart as this continues to cook. Lastly, let's add a few flavor enhancers. Two bay leaves, a Parmesan cheese rind. When you've used up your hard cheese blocks, save those rinds for this exact purpose and a sprig of basil. Give that one last good mix. And once this reaches a nice bubbly simmer, the lid goes on partially so that the moisture gradually cooks off and our sauce gets thick and, well, saucy. 
which is going to take about three to four hours. So I'm going to move this over to an off-camera burner where it will simmer partially covered over low heat. I'm going to check on it and stir it periodically to make sure nothing is burning, nothing is sticking to the bottom, and if it needs a splash or two of additional water to keep it from reducing too much too soon, I will add it. Okay, next up, we're going to work on our cheesy layer. That starts with one pound, or about 450 grams, of ricotta cheese. We're going to flavor the ricotta mixture starting with fresh basil. Just like we did last week in part one, the antipasti salad, we're going to roll up the leaves together and shred them thinly so we get small pieces that are distributed throughout the lasagna. There are recipes out there that call for a layer of whole leaves of basil in the lasagna. I personally don't love the idea of pulling full-size leaves of wilted basil out of my lasagna as I eat it. I'd much rather have it in small shreds. We're adding this for flavor, not so much for its texture. Also flavoring our ricotta mixture, we have Parmigiano-Reggiano cheese. Other hard Italian cheeses will work here too, but Parmesan is classic for its deep, rich, nutty flavor. Next, man, this stuff just pops up everywhere, doesn't it? It's our quick and easy roasted garlic from series one, episode 11. I'm using the rich, flavorful paste of three cloves of roasted garlic. Just squirt it right in there. Next, two whole eggs will help the ricotta layer set as it cooks. By the way, this mixture is a great place to experiment if you'd like to. In the past, I've added chopped artichoke hearts, olives, sun-dried tomatoes, mushrooms, even more garlic. You could also stir in green or red pesto as an alternative to the fresh basil, if you'd like. If you're feeling froggy, this is a great opportunity to raid your cupboards and get creative. Let's set this aside in the fridge covered with plastic wrap and let the flavors come together a bit. The sauce is simmering, the ricotta filling is resting. We come now to the age-old question that has haunted humanity for millennia. How the heck do you make keto-friendly lasagna noodles? This is how. In a bowl, we're starting with equal parts extra-fine almond flour and lupin flour. I probably have about one cup of each here. Next, in goes just a pinch of xanthan gum, maybe half a teaspoon, if that. Now we're adding vital wheat gluten. Normal wheat flour that you'd use to make normal pasta is usually about 13 to 15% gluten, somewhere in there. So I'm eyeballing that amount based on the rest of the dry ingredients. Remember, gluten is the mostly proteiny part of the wheat. It adds very few carbs. On the side, I'm going to keep a bowl handy that contains the same proportions of our dry ingredients, except the xanthan gum. This has just the flours and the wheat gluten. This is what we'll use to flour our work surface. For this quantity of dry ingredients, we're going to use four whole eggs. And just as if we were making conventional wheat pasta, we're going to beat the eggs in the center, gradually pulling in the dry ingredients until we end up with a cohesive dough that we can knead with our hands. And that's just what we'll do. For about five to seven minutes or so, I'm kneading our dough blob, gradually incorporating more of our flour mixture until it reaches the necessary consistency for pasta. When we start, our dough is kind of pasty and fragile. I can just pull a piece right off of it. But after several minutes of kneading using the plop, pull, and fold method, we're left with a dough that we can shape into a cohesive ball. The kneading has developed the gluten, so the dough is no longer flaky and crumbly, it's stretchy and bouncy. The dough is ready when you can poke it and watch it spring back into shape a little. It is this flexible, elastic quality that enables us to form this into pasta noodles that will actually hold their shape. Boop. This dough ball needs to rest for about one hour at room temperature, so just cover it tightly with plastic wrap, and set it somewhere out of the way while we prepare to actually form it into broad, thin sheets. I'll be using a genuine, no kidding, pasta machine today, which feels great because I haven't made fresh pasta in a long time. The whole keto thing, you know? If you don't own a pasta machine like this, they are easy to get your hands on. I'll put a link to this one in the description below, or you can just roll the dough out using a rolling pin. It's just going to require a little more patience and precision if you do it by hand. 
With my pasta machine clamped firmly to the countertop, the handle inserted, and my dough ball properly rested for one hour, we can begin. I'm slicing off an end of the pasta ball so that I have a roughly oval-shaped piece of dough to work with. I'm pressing this flat using our dry mixture to make sure it doesn't stick to anything. And with the pasta machine on the widest setting, that's number zero, I'm going to run this through. Nice. Next, we're going to complete a process known as laminating. No, we're not coating this in hot plastic. We're folding it back on itself in thirds and running it through the machine once again on the widest setting. Laminating helps to further the gluten development, which will give our finished pasta that smooth yet firm pasta texture. We're going to laminate a third time and now, we'll start narrowing the space between the pasta machine's rollers to get thinner and thinner sheets. This is setting number one, and next setting number two, and so on. On my machine, the ideal thickness for lasagna noodles is setting number seven. How will you know what the right thickness is? Well, you should be able to see your hand through it. Hello! Actually, it is said in Italy that you should be able to read a love letter through it. Or, to put it in more modern terms, you should be able to see the heart emoji through it, but please don't touch your gross phone to the pasta. I'm going to cut sheets of pasta to fit the pan I'll be using, right about there. If you have extra leftover end pieces, set those to the side and keep them handy. They're great for filling in spaces as we build our lasagna. And we just repeat the process, laminating and rolling progressively thinner sheets of dough and sizing them to fit our lasagna pan. As you accumulate more and more noodle sheets, you don't want to stack these on top of each other. They will stick. So make sure you separate them with something, parchment paper or, as I'm doing, paper towels. When at last you've rolled your final noodle and you have a nice stack of pasta sheets, we're ready. We're ready to build the low-carb lasagna of your dreams. Let's get situated here. Our meat sauce looks and smells spectacular. It has reduced and thickened noticeably. Go ahead and season to taste with salt, pepper, oregano, and anything else you think this needs more of. And now we're going to use a classic sauce finishing move. Very cold, unsalted butter. Stir that in while it's warm, and you'll see this thicken as the butter slowly melts and emulsification happens, and it leaves our sauce rich, glossy, and ready for action. In your most experienced, reliable, and trustworthy baking tray, let's coat the bottom with a few spoonfuls of sauce. This helps to ensure that our finished lasagna slices come out of the pan without sticking. Next, let's layer on some noodles. And to cover that end where I slightly underestimated the length of the pan, I'm just going to cut a strip off of one of those reserved end pieces. See? Perfect. On top of the noodle layer goes our ricotta cheese mixture, spread as thinly as you can while still achieving full coverage. Speaking of full cheese coverage, next we're adding just a ton of freshly shredded low moisture whole milk mozzarella cheese. Admit it, you were getting a little nervous when we hadn't mentioned mozzarella cheese yet. I have two pounds, that's more than 900 grams of the smooth melty stuff. Notice, I very deliberately said freshly shredded mozzarella cheese. Don't use pre-shredded, pre-packaged cheese in this, please. Pre-shredded cheeses contain additives that, one, are unnecessary, nutritionally speaking, and two, make the cheese melt weird. Shred your own cheese for this one, you won't be disappointed. On the subject of shredded cheese, we're adding even more Parmesan for structure and flavor. And that's one complete cycle of lasagna layering. It goes meat sauce, pasta sheets, trimming the extra bits to fill the gaps as needed, ricotta mixture, and shredded mozzarella and Parmesan. Repeat that pattern until you get to what will be the very top layer of pasta sheets. And on top of that goes a final mixture of cheese and sauce, with most of the cheese going on the very top. Make sure you get plenty of cheese around the edges, right up against the edge of the pan, because that's where we'll get that awesome, crusty, crunchy, almost burnt bits of cheese that lasagna is world famous for. Whew! That's a lot, I know. I feel ya. It will be worth all the work when this beauty comes out of the oven, though. 
We're going to cover this tightly with foil. This is going to ensure that the whole thing has a chance to cook fully before we start working on that top cheese crust. And this is going into an oven preheated to 375 degrees Fahrenheit or 190 degrees Celsius for one hour to start. After one hour, we're going to remove the foil. Oh, that smells amazing and put it back in for between 20 and 30 minutes or until the cheese layer on top is just the way you like it. For me, that means dark, crunchy edges and toasted, bubbly cheese all across the top. And after cooking uncovered for just about 30 minutes, that is exactly what we achieve. A hot, bubbly surface of perfectly toasted cheese stretching out from coast to coast as far as the eye can see. Mm. I know you really want to eat it now, I do too, but we can't quite yet. If you've ever cut into a casserole too soon, you know that we'll get a gooey mess if we dig in right now. Let this rest for at least 30 minutes, but if you made a lasagna that's as thick and wide and deep and large as mine is, that's going to be more like 45 minutes to an hour. I mean, look at this thing. It's huge. Okay, it's been nearly an hour and I can't take it anymore, so let's do this. Let's do this. Using a thin knife to cut and a wide spatula to scoop. <gasps> there it is. Breathtaking. Let's finish this quickly so I can eat it. As we do with so many Italian dishes, we're going to start with a drizzle of extra virgin olive oil. Still more shredded cheese, if you can believe that. This is Pecorino Romano cheese. I thought I'd change things up a bit here since we have quite a bit of Parmesan in this already and a lovely little sprig of fresh basil. And if you feel yours needs it, you can hit this with some salt and pepper to taste as well. This looks gorgeous from any angle, especially that crunchy, cheesy crust. If that's your thing, you're going to be very happy. And I know what you're thinking right now. You're thinking, oh my goodness, this looks amazing. I can't wait to try it at home. Kettle and Bones is my favorite keto cooking channel ever, etc., etc. And I thank you for that. I was hoping you'd like it. But you might also be wondering, what's the actual carb count here? When it comes to lasagna, how low is a low carb version exactly? Well, based on the ingredient amounts that went into this, for the whole tray, we're looking at roughly 130 grams of net carbs. Whole tray. Most of that comes from the tomato products. If we keep going with big old slices like this, we can cut this four by five. That's 20 slices. That's six and a half grams of carbs per serving. If we go just a little thinner and maybe slice it five by six, we'll get 30 generous portions at four and one third grams of carbs per slice. Four and one third grams of carbs per slice for lasagna. In the timeless words of Pope Nicholas V, that's some low carb lasagna right there. Stay with Kettle and Bones for many, many more incredible, edible, borderline unbelievable versions of your favorite foods. I know you're probably feeling pretty full right now just looking at this, but don't fill up completely. Glance away, because next week we're concluding this keto Italian dinner mini-series with il dolce, the sweet dessert, the perfect thing to follow this fantastic entree. But for now, just enjoy your meaty lasagna.